Today we have uh, Nahi Park um, from uh, Queen's University. Uh, Nahi got her PhD from Iwa Women's University in South Korea. And um, she was a John McCall Fellow at Wisconsin and a, a research scientist in, at the University of Chicago. And after that, uh, since 2020, she's a, she's a professor at, uh, at Queen's uh, in Kingston, so very nearby. Um, she's also a member of Helix, uh, Veritas, P1, Ice Cube, and Ice Cube Gen 2. So a lot of experience on high energy particles and neutrinos. And yeah, she will be talking to us uh, about observations of the high energy particle accelerators in our uh, universe. So thanks a lot, Mae, for joining us. And, uh, Take it away. Hey, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, whenever I had to talk about high energy particle observation, it's just because I uh, introduced I work on the cosmic ray and gamma ray and neutrino. I always wondering about going narrow in one subject, but I always deported to talk broadly about everything just because I love to talk about different uh, particles, just because in the end everything should make sense, right? So that I think it makes sense. But if anything is too boringly generous, just let me know or start yawning, then I will move forward. <laughs> All right, so before I move on, I have to acknowledge that Queens is situated, I mean, it's nearby, right? Queens is situated in a traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee traditional land. It's beautiful. I really enjoy being there. It's uh, ever so slightly warmer than Madison. So that's, <laughs> that's at least one plus. All right. So I initially started my research career looking at the cosmic ray. So I feel like every slide that I show has to start with this slide. And so this is the cosmic ray spectrum, as all of you know. I assume so. Energy goes very wide from the GeV of the 10 to the 21 electron volt, and the flux range is varying very much. And uh, the composition changes depending on which energy you are looking at. And in the end, we discovered this particle in 1912, when we still do not know where they are coming from. And it still stands true. But at the same time, I would like to also point out that we learned quite a lot about this particle, especially during the last decades with the space experiments, such as MS02, etc., uh, explored and then find a lot of details. So I will not talk about it, but I will just uh, test to motivate, because this is the direct evidence that there is a high energy accelerator in our universe that can accelerate a particle frequently in GeV to TeV energy range and go up to the 10 to the 21 electron volts, uh, which is really powerful, right? Just letting you know that the highest energy that our sun can generate is about GeV, that's the solar energy particles, and so that is the lowest end of the cosmic ray. So again, whatever is accelerator that can accelerate this particle it has to be more extreme than our sun can create. So that is what we want. And we also know that the cosmic ray has to move from galactic cosmic ray to the extra galactic cosmic ray. The reason just because if energy goes, uh, if cosmic ray is a proton, and if energy of proton is higher than 10 to the 18 electron volts, the gyro radius of those particles is larger than the size of our galaxy. So it has to come from outside our galaxy. That's why we know that the highest end has to be extra galactic. But one other thing is where the transition happened is a very, very traditional question that we have been asking for decades now. And so again, I'm going to talk about the cosmic ray in detail. So this is my last slide about the cosmic ray. But one thing I wanted to broadcast to everyone whenever I have a chance is that the cosmic ray measurement has been improved a lot uh, in last decades. For example, when I was defending my PhD, I hope that it's not revealing my age here, uh, this kind of uh, flux uh, change with energy and composition change was predicted, but it was prediction and it was very naive prediction about gyro radius, acceleration, limitation, etc. But now we have measurement. And the measurement, as you can see, is very more complicated than people naively expected. And traditionally, people th thought that uh, 10 to the 15 electron volt is where the energy maximum that can be typically gained from the galactic accelerator. But now what we see is much more wiggles in the spectrum. So every single wiggle has to have some reason why it's there. So the question is where they are coming from. And from the direct passing ray, we know that at least one of these around G, 200 GB 
uh, energy range the, where the ripple of course that happens that was not expected actually uh, is maybe because of the propagation but where it's actually coming from is really active in new research area another new thing that we learn is in the highest energy range in 10 to the 21 electron volt people somehow naively expect it to be ggk cut off when the highest energy of proton of 10 to the 21 electron volts start making an interaction with the CMB and suppression happens. But now we are not quite sure about it because according to Pierre Rose experiments, the composition at the highest energy of cosmic ray is heavier than proton. It's about neonish. Of course, they don't they cannot say with a neon versus proton or ion, but the, the low logarithmic uh, mass is indicating it's more like middle uh, elements. So if, if that is the case, this suppression is not coming from GK, and why then it's there is still again active research area. Maybe it's maximum energy that can be accelerated in the particular accelerator, or maybe there's another suppression coming from the interaction. We do not know. But again, this is new information that was not revealed before. Another thing you probably heard about is a positive fraction excess. So positron is traditionally believed to be created during the propagation of a cosmic ray. And if that is the case, naively, you expect positron to be following this blue line. This is naive propagation. But what AMS-02, Pamela and Bermila is measuring is basically large excess of a positron. And again, we do not know where, where this is origin is coming from. People say maybe it's a propagation effect, or maybe there's a secondary Cosmic ray created in the source of scientists because there's a lot of medium around there, or maybe there's a positron accelerator in the universe, or if you are the dark matter people and just love it time meter, then maybe uh, this is a uh, dark matter decay. Of course, it's too strong to be purely dark matter, but you know that doesn't deter people to talk about it. Anyway, so there's a lot of uh, questions about the cosmic ray, uh, but one thing that I wanted to Point out is that even if we learned a lot about the cosmic ray with a really improved measurement thanks to the space based experiments, we still do not know where these particles are coming from. We get more hints of where these are coming from, but we still don't know where they are coming from. And of course, this is a standard HILAS diagram. Basically, you have a magnetic field, and if you have a large area, then you can confine the charge of the particle, maybe through fermi acceleration, whatever, you can gain some dynamic energy and then can accelerate the particle. So that has been traditional for many, many decades. And so how high energy a astrophysical source society accelerate the particle is depending on the size of the acceleration reason and the magnetic field, right? If you have a low magnetic field of a DPS a large area, then you can still accelerate the particle to high energy. Or if you are like a neutron star, like very compact reason and high magnetic field, we may be able to still accelerate up to the 10 to the 21 electron volt. This is really like second year physics uh, calculation can give you this information, um, but so where, but the, the end of the question is, so are these actually all cosmic ray accelerator? Can we actually tell about that? So obviously we can, it's hard to tell by looking at the cosmic ray because cosmic ray is charged the particles, so they are bending inside the magnetic field. So there has been an attempt to look at the anisotropy of cosmic ray, because if you somehow magically have more source in that direction than the other direction, you may see a little bit of dipole that area. That's, uh, that's uh, as much as you can. So there was a study about that, and we have now two anisotropy measurements in cosmic ray. One is measured the energy of about 10 TeV. You can see that there is a dipole, there's a preferred direction there. And then energy as high as 8 TeV, we now see about the 10% of anisotropy. Uh, and then you kind of can point out the location of dipole, and they, Pierre Rosé said that that's actually all from the galactic plane, which is really providing the direct evidence that at 10 to the 18 electron volt, we now can say the origin of this energy causing ray is extra galactic. Because if it is galactic, then you would expect it to be pointing to the galactic plane, but dipole is off from the galactic plane. So it's an excellent measurement. But at the same time, if this was composition is lighter, then we expect it to be more information squeezing out of an isotropy, but unfortunately it's heavier. And so it kind of matches 10% matches with the composition measurement they have measured. Uh, 10 TeV uh, 
and I told you there was a lot of speculation, maybe this is pointing toward the Bella direction, etc. But now the consensus is, is largely due to the local magnetic field the line around the heliosphere is creating this anisotropy seems to be consensus. So it's not really related with the source, which also show how complicated it is to study the original passing rate only based on the passing rate measurement. You need to be careful. So this, this has to do then with the motion of the sun relative to the local interstellar medium. That's giving rise to the it's an, uh, it's an interstellar magnetic field is wrapping around the heliosphere has a particular preference in the angle. So this one is matched, matched with the uh, neutron hydrogen measurement, neutron element measurement done by someone. I cannot remember ISM. I couldn't remember the name of it. But anyway, they measure the magnetic field and that's exactly matching like that. So it's kind of consensus on that. All right. So, so are we done with the studying the source of cosmic ray just because cosmic ray is a bending inside the mind field? Thankfully, practical physics happens in the universe as much as it happens in LHC, so that we know that when the cosmic ray is accelerated by some powerful accelerator like supernova remnants, then it may interact with the hydrogen just because our galaxy is full of hydrogen or you know neutral hydrogen or whatever. Um, so then maybe inelastic interaction can happen with the, given the cross section that we can measure from the particle accelerator. And as a result, you would create secondary particles. So PP interaction creates pi zero and pi plus minus. And as a result, in the end, you create the gamma rays and neutrinos. And these particles are charge neutral. What that means is that they will streak coming from the source side to us. And so if this interaction happens more, more frequently around the source region, which you know you kind of expect to happen, right? Because one of our remnants have a shell that is a higher density compared to the interstellar medium in average. So this interaction will happen a lot. So what that means is it should shine in the neutrino and gamma ray. And again, they can straight from the source and we can actually study the mass array. The issue or difficulty with the gamma ray is the gamma ray can also be created in the inverse complex scattering, which is electron, and so that will come into play later. And compared to that, neutrino can be only created in the hadronic acceleration. And so that is really nice indication of a hadronic accelerator. And you would learn that I emphasize quite a lot of a hadronic acceleration just because the cosmic ray we measured at Earth is 90 whatever percent hadron, 99 percent probably hadron above 1 TeV. So we know that most of cosmic ray is hadron. So that means you know nuclei, negative nuclei, and so that's why we wanted to learn about the hadronic accelerator to understand the cosmic ray we measure in the Earth. Of course, electron itself is very interesting, and most of the electromagnetic wave that we are studying from the radio and x-ray is all electron interactions. And so I, I think the gamma is interesting because it actually can see both electronic interaction as well as hydronic interaction. All right, so extra galactic causing rays case is a similar thing. Uh, in elastic interaction happens and gamma ray and neutrino is created. But the difference is, is that gamma rays just cannot go very far in the extra galactic sky just because it starts to have interaction with uh, extra uh, EBL, extra galactic, what is it, EBL, extra background light, extra galactic background light, I'm sorry. So any galaxy that is creating the star light ever since the creation of the star is accumulated and then causing may see that field when it's traveling. So at, say, for example, one TeV energy of particles just cannot go very far, right? It can go up to maybe zero point, I mean, even not very far, uh, about zero point zero or something. It's very low for is one TeV gamma ray seeing. And at around um, 100 GeV, uh, that's where the, where the gamma ray can see up to maybe uh, redshift of one. That's about it. Uh, we cannot really see any farther. So that means that neutrino is providing the only messenger in, in this energy range. When I say this energy, range, the energy higher than 10 TeV, uh, neutrino is the only messenger to directly study the high energy interaction in our universe. So that makes neutrino very interesting. All right. Up to now, nobody is yawning. This is not all the news to you. <laughs> all right. So I will now really focus on the gamma ray observation and neutrino observation. Just correct that last thing because I think yeah. I did something. Uh, you said earlier that you, know, you have these heavier particles. Mm -hmm. 
they won't be so subject to this exact. In other words, the cosmic rays, if they're heavier than that high energy, yeah. are they still going to bend like that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They are even going to bend even more, right? Because the heavier means it's a higher charge. And so uh, they would be okay. the Well, the even charge mass ratio is going to stay about the same. Yeah, but still, I think mass is less important at that energy. It's okay. already relativistic. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. All right. So, how do we measure gamma rays? So, again, it's the same electromagnetic wave that you may be familiar with. It's just the energy is very, very high, right? Above 100 GB or so is what we call a uh, very high energy gamma ray. <laughs> it's all jargon. Uh, but anyway, so in that energy range, gamma rays start to interact with atmosphere. And it creates electron positive pair, so and then it just reaches like air show, yeah. Question if you're fine to yeah, um, can we detect massive neutrinos in these processes? Can we detect the massive neutrinos? There are studies and there are search going on, and I, I think we have upper limits and there are people who the ice cube has a, a separate working working group that is looking at all beyond the standard model, and I know that they probably did that, yeah. All right. We haven't detected it, obviously. <laughs> All right, so a single gamma ray can create the millions of electron and the positron pairs, and because they are charged particle, and because the energy of the initial gamma ray was so high, this electron and positron pair move relatively in our atmosphere, meaning that they move faster than speed of light in the air. And so, when that happens, bluish light all the chunk of light coming in. I feel like I'm going into <laughs> to elementary description here. So this kind of uh, wave of front of a blue chunk of light is traveling as air shower develops. And so we can we can detect the gamma ray by looking at this light or by looking at the, the particle. And both methods has been used. And when you are looking at the gamma ray, the cosmic ray become your background because there's more cosmic ray interacting and creating the same air shower as a gamma ray and so it's really major amount of background but you can see that the morphology of gamma ray looks a little bit different from the proton right? because proton interaction is a hadronic interaction so it's a little bit more massive the momentum transfer is a little bit more massive so it tends to be spread out more sparse compared to gamma ray it tends to be much more symmetric much more sharper so that's how we uh, recognize the differences between the proton and the gamma ray and so there are two methods that we use to measure the very high energy gamma rays. One is called the Imaging Atmospheric Cherenkov Telescope, like uh, Veritas, which is on part of, and the other is Ground Air Shower Ray. So any caution ray air shower will actually be able to measure gamma ray if it is designed properly. So how it happens is when air shower is developing, as I said before, Cherenkov light is shining with about radius of uh, a few hundred meter. And so if you are in that light cone, you can collect the light and you can go, um, you can move back to the sky to see where it's coming from. If you have more than one telescope, then it kind of narrows down your angular resolution and you can say, oh, my shower coming from that and look at the, where that is in your sky. And that's how you look at the, um, you can look at the gamma rays. And in air shower's case, basically they see the particle that is created from the air shower and the particle will sweep through as it's developing. So by looking at how it's moving and speed and shower front and how much light you collect, how, many, how much particle you collect, then you can estimate the energy and then direction and then estimate the gamma rate that way. And so just because I'm working on the Veritas, I will go a little bit more in detail in Veritas. This is Veritas, it's a parking lot. Usually more car cars are parked. We took this particular picture after moving all the cars out. So it looked a little bit more decent. And so it's an imaging atmospheric chunk of telescope. We have a four of them. And if you have a more telescope, it's better to improve your angular resolution. Multiple measurements works better than single measurement. And so Veritas it has been fully operational since 2007. And we measure from about 85 GB up to 30 TB. Uh, we always say this, we actually can get even farther, but your energy estimation becomes bad as the energy goes higher just because the air shower becomes too big, so it cannot be contained in the telescope. And if you look at the picture, this is actually how Veritas looks, and so you can see compared to the 
person, it's a pretty large reflector, it's a 12 meter reflector. And so it's one of the largest optical telescope and we actually measure things in a two nanoseconds resolution so we can capture the brief uh, chunk of light that's sweeping through the telescope very easily. So Veritas can detect 1% percent crab nebula crab nebula, of course, with nebula is the strongest stable galactic source in the sky. So that's why the very high gamma ray people always talk about the crab strength. And so 1% percent crab strength we talk, talk, took up us about 25 hours. To give you an idea, with the four telescope, if I just look at the single telescope, the trigger rate is about kilohertz. And if I require all telescopes to see the same signal, the trigger rates go down to 300 hertz. So at that point, we are actually looking at the air shower. But even at that hertz, most of the, the signal that we are seeing is air shower coming from the cosmic ray. Because the stable and the strongest the source crap nebula, the signal strength we see is about 0 0.25 hertz. So about you know 80% of shower we are detecting is coming from so we always need to be statistically careful about what we are seeing is a signal or not. And that's why you will hear a lot of the significance argument whenever we talk about gamma ray, and it's even worse for the neutrinos. <coughs> and so Veritas obviously need to catch very brief light coming from the air shower. So that means that we need to have a super dark observed dark time, so no cloud, no moon. And that means that we have about 1,000 hours per year for the observation. And so that's what we have been doing. So does this help if you go farther to the UV? Because I would think that if you go farther than UV, there's going to be less background light. No, UV doesn't really quite help because the, the chunk of radiation is much abundance in the UV, but the cosmic ray also creates the chunk of So in the end, there is limitation of how much you can do just because there's a cosmic ray background you always need to handle. The galactic's a little bit worse just because starlight and all right. that, yeah. but the, the main dominant sensitivity hurt is coming from the cosmic ray. So uh, maybe again, this is all what maybe you already know, but in 1987 there was one source that was crab nebula, and in 2023 now we have more than 200 sources. So we discovered um, you know 200 sources over 30 years or so. And not only that is discovery of a number of sources, but also different classes of sources that we are discovering. So as you can see here, we see the Pulsar Nebula, X-ray binary, Pulsar, AGNs, I mean, especially blazars, and the star burst galaxies, and, and the star, star forming region, I don't think it's actually like a 5 sigma. So anyway, so there's a variety of astronomical objects that is particle exhalation enough to create 100 GB. Gamma ray. So typically, if it is pi pi, typically if it is proton proton interaction and pi zero decay into creating the gamma ray, then about ten percent of energy goes to the gamma ray, roughly speaking. So one hundred GeV gamma ray means that the uh, proton that created that gamma ray has to be about one TV or higher. And so that's a uh, hand waving way. So how it is correlating with the cosmic that we are observing. So the the unit sources are unidentified. Yes, that we will talk about. That. There is a, a lot of sources that's unidentified that I will talk about. Um, are those typically high extinction? Hmm? Are those typically high galactic? Extinction? Mostly they are high, yeah, but there are some unidentified sources that also is, there's a, I think one unidentified source in extra galactic, uh, just because we are not sure whether it's a blazer versus uh, a part of the radio galaxy. Um, and then most of but that's only one source, and most of all identified sources is in the galaxy. So I, just a quick question yeah. then. Of the positively identified mm -hmm. supernova remnants, mm -hmm. or also in that, mm -hmm. how old do they go and you can still see them? How old? How Ooh, old can they be? Tens of a thousand a year, I okay. think, you see it. So there could be a, some extinct supernova remnants that are I don't think so. I think no. all the sort of RAM that we see is typically, let me think about it. I think there are some the radio, old, right? yeah, yeah, we do see the radio, radio. Yeah, 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 yeah. most okay. of the sort of RAM that we see is very strong in the radio. I think the person we live is a little more tricky 
to speak. Uh, I will talk about it actually, but a few so, examples. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you for stopping. I also wanted to point out that we are still discovering new sources, source uh, class, right? For example, in 2018, we first detected a micro case as an interaction. This is SS433. It's, we, also, we don't actually see the micro case except, but we see the jet interacting point. And so that was interesting. Uh, now we just detected the GRB. Now we have a four or five GRB detected and there was nobody detected. So again, new thing is uh, discovered as, as So you're talking about seeing that you see both ends of the jet? Yeah. So what's your spatial resolution? So spatial resolution for the ground, very high energy IAC T scale is about better than 0 0.0, better than 0 0.1. We typically say 0 0.1 to be politically correct, but it's uh, close to 0 0.06 to 7 degree. Uh, we are conservative kind of people, isn't yeah. it? All right, so what, what we learned here is that, first of all, the very high energy gamma ray sky is very, very bright with electronic. Again, cosmic rays we observe in the Earth is 90 whatever percent hadron, but turns out that electrons is really, really easy. Electrons are really easy to create the gamma rays. So in gamma rays case, again, it's uh, inverse Compton scattering, high energy electron is pushing all the photon field, CMB, or uh, just star field and create the high energy gamma ray. And that seems to be really dominant processes that we are observing in a very high energy gamma rays. So the cl source classes that we see, which we think is likely electronic dominant is person with nebula, binary, uh, micro, Jet case, jet interaction, and the blazer and the radio flat, uh, radio galaxies. Uh, and binary, do you mean uh, binary accretion, or do you mean colliding wind and everything? We see both. Uh, so there is a colliding wind, clear colliding wind case. I think, what was the name of that day? No, I think I cannot remember the top of my head. There's a one case we know that you win the minimum case. But most of binary that we see is high mass X ray binaries. And so you may ask me, like, how do you know whether it's electronic dominant? And one way of looking at it is basically looking at the, the uh, energy, spectral energy distribution. So this is a crab nebula. So in X axis, the energy. So here is radio of the very high energy gamma ray. And so we know the X ray can be explained by. Uh, synchrotron radiation. And if you know the environment enough, uh, your magnetic field and your uh, electron distribution, then you, you can estimate what kind of inverse Compton spectrum you would expect it to see, and it matches very well with what we observe with very high energy gamma ray. So in that case, it looks like a beautiful case, especially Krebs case. It's a self inverse Compton scattering case. It's a really nice case. Uh, so that's one way for us to say that the energetic point of view of this has to be electronic dominant. Another way to figure out whether it's leptonic is by looking at how the extension of gamma ray observation, gamma ray emission is changing with energy. Because as energy goes higher, electron loses energy because of radiation loss in the magnetic field, etc. So you would expect the high energy electron to be more focused around the source region versus low energy. So in this particular person with nebula, you can see energy lower than one TV, the extension of uh, um, the, the source is about one degree, but as energy goes higher, you can see that it's shrinking and at energy higher than 32 TV is really compactly around the pulsar. And so that's why we know that it has to be a person with nebula and it has to be electronic dominant. Because if it is hydronium, we don't quite expect it to be very rapidly changing or follow the size depending on the energy. So that's another one. Another one we can do is basically correlate with the X-ray observation because X-ray we know there has to be synchrotron radiation. And so if it is well correlated ups and down of flux of X-ray, then it's indication that it is uh, leptonic dominant. So for example, this is one of the binary, um, I think it's a HES 0632, um, that you see the X-ray versus the gamma ray is really well correlated in the phase space. So it's pretty nice indication as to the leptonic. All right, so you may ask, so we don't have any hadronic accelerator, we do. Uh, supernova remnants has been one of the clear uh, case of a hadronic acceleration and the hadronic dominated gamma ray. So how do you know whether it's a hadronic? One is looking at the coincidence with the molecular cloud in the sky. So here is IC443 in visible light. And so that is the shell that you see and bright in the radio, and this is diffused away. But if you look at the gamma ray sky, you can see the brightest part is actually this part of the uh, Bremen. The reason why is this because there is a really large and a thick molecular cloud around that, that, that 
spatial uh, area, and the gamma rays very well correlate with the molecular cloud distribution. In that case, it makes sense it has to be a hadronic ray because a hadron is interacting and creating more gamma ray if the density of medium is higher. So spatial, spatial correlation is one way to indicate that it's a hadronic dominated. Another way is basically if you know your object very, very well, history very well, the environment very well, then you can estimate, okay, how much we expected to coming from the uh, electron versus a hadron. And we fortunately have a few historic supernova remnants that is well studied and we know the environment relatively very well, especially type of cases, type 1A supernova remnants, and so the environment is much cleaner. In that case, multi-wavelength observation seems to be indicating it may be a hadron compared to leptonic. In gamma ray perspective, we, we like one of the things we basically do in a rough estimation is a spectral index. If your spectral index is close to two, then we think it's a hadronic just because uh, naive Fermi acceleration gives the index of 2.1 or so. And so if it is gamma ray created from the pi and k, then we expect the gamma ray spectrum to be following the parent's crossing ray uh, spectrum. So we should, should see uh, 2.1. Uh, each spectral index until it goes the highest energy that you may cut off. That's a naive expectation, which you can see the Tycho is following very well. But with the gamma ray observation, what we learned is that it actually changes as time. It makes sense, right? The spinal remnant shock speed is the fastest when it's created and it slow down as it age. And so that changes acceleration. So that's what we actually see. So KSA and Tycho is a pretty flat, nicely 2.1 spectrum, but it kind of uh, rolls off versus uh, IC 443's case, it's actually not 2.1, it's very softer spectral index. It's probably just because the acceleration in that spin of remnant is not as efficient as, uh, as Young's spin of remnant, so index is softer. So is IC 433 the brightest and gamma rays in the sky? No. Uh, Supernova remnants, yeah. right? Then we think about it. About right. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a bit older, but it's near a molecular cloud. That's, that's right. why. That's so. right. That's right. Yeah, I was hesitating. It's about three percent nebula. I think the other one that is bright is uh, gamma yeah. spin, which is about three percent. Another thing is there's also southern sky. There's a really bright gamma ray supernova remnant, which I usually don't think about it because I am working on very fast, thus cannot watch southern sky. But I think RxJ18, uh, I think that one's pretty bright. There are a few other supernova remnant that's particularly like 10% crap bright. So I don't think IC-423 is the brightest, but it's one of the brighter uh, supernova remnants. So you think this is from shock dissipation, changing slope? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Have people made those calculations with um, mm -hmm. have people made those calculations with you have some Fermi acceleration and you just fed the shock? I think there are some calculations, I think that's okay. really detailed, but uh, I, I I think it's not really surprising to see the softening on spectrum as age. And if you actually look at the spectral indices with age, there's a tendency of getting softer as age late. So one other thing that I wanted to know is that the cutoff here is basically indicating how high the energy can go in that particular accelerator. And if we naively say that the largest passing rate spectral change we observe at the Earth, which is 10 to the 8, 10 to the 15 electron volt, is coming from galactic galactic accelerator cannot accelerate more than this energy kind of level, then we naively expect to see gamma ray emission to be around, to go up to at least 100 TeV without cutoff. And so that has been always, if you hear of a pebatron from the gamma ray community, that's what it is. We always search for, for the pebatron to say that, oh, this is a pebatron, that is why the knee is coming from the energy maximum that can happen in the galactic accelerator. But unfortunately, in the supernova remnants, none of, but even the youngest supernova remnant cannot accelerate to that energy range. We don't know why. It's a still kind of ongoing issue. Uh, we don't have a clear hadronic tabatron yet. If you hear anything tabatron from gamma rays, it's electronic tabatron. And so this is ongoing kind of a question mark. We don't, we don't know why we are not seeing it. It doesn't make sense. So what I suggest to translate tabatron is 10 to 15, right? Yeah. So that's the knee, and, the, yeah, yeah, that's and right. so it's a long-standing debate 
Yeah. I don't need to tell you this, but <laughs> what the source of those 10 to 15 yeah. electron volt cosmic rays yeah. is. And so you're you're saying it's clear evidence in the gamma rays that supernova remnants don't work? No. So, I mean, but the thing is, but it could we be only. Like that, right? Well, um, I mean, there, I, I cannot say that it don't work. I have to say we don't have evidence that is sort of remnant can do, right? Because we only see this part of the history. Because, because of the gamma ray observation being this, now people are suggesting that it has to be super, super young, right? And then you need to have that happen. And that didn't happen. And so I'm not excluding supernova remnants, but the historic supernova remnant cannot do that. Um, there are also the people who is more naive and then still didn't give up on the supernova remnant idea, idea. And they say, oh, maybe there's a many steps there. It's like a little bit. Uh, yeah, so no, I, I would not dare say supernova remnant is not it, but I would say we don't have a strong evidence that supernova remnant can do it as we all do right now. All right, another thing is you pointed out how many unidentified sources there. It turns out that about 40% of galaxy TV gamma ray sources are unidentified sources. And so we do actually now have, because LASO is online now, they are far away, they are excellent sensitivity at the hundred tens of TV, they are, they beat the ICT measurement really easily because so they- what kind of, is that also as a check number, what's that? This one is the air shower array. Air shower. But the uh, air shower array in uh, the most ridiculously large way, they, they have a huge, gigantic air, air shower array. And so they measure up to PEB, and they actually measure the PEB gamma ray, which also was not expected. We expected, you know, with client machine region and all, so we didn't expect it to see PEB gamma ray, but they actually see it. And so that's another thing that is going on why gamma ray is surviving that high energy, which I'm not going to cover today. But one thing I'm going to just point out is that above 100 TV, which is, you know, Five years ago, we didn't think that this we would see this sky, but we now have the sky, and we have 43 sources detected above for sigma significance, and a lot of them are unidentified. And you may ask, like, why is it unidentified? Um, it's many, many reasons why it is unidentified. Um, this is just a summary of all the gamma ray sources we ever detected, so 200 of them, and how their spectrum distribution looks like. And so you kind of can see that the extragalactic sources are softer. That's just because the EVL absorption is there. And one thing that I wanted to point out is that unidentified sources tends to be in the population that has a harder spectral index, which is really intriguing. Again, we are always looking for the spectral index of two because that's a high on decay indication. And so we want we were wondering now, including myself, whether some of the unidentified sources can explain cosmic ray up to PV energy range. And so that is why people are now really <coughs> wanting to study and understand this unidentified source. And one of the studies that I'm doing right now is this particular source. And I'm picking this one just to, is to explain you what do you mean by unidentified source? What I mean by unidentified source is that either there's too many sources in the field of view, and we cannot distinctively point out that which source is the cause of gamma ray emission, or we don't have enough source in the field of view to say that this is the reason. So supernova remnant G 106.3 reasons in the latter case that we don't have enough source in the field of view to say what is the cause of this supernova remnant, uh, this gamma ray emission, because we do see gamma ray up to PV energy range for this one. As you can see, spectrum is more or less hard, and so it kind of all fits with a nice hadronic acceleration theory, but uh, it's really hard to say whether it's a hadronic or a leptonic or what is original with this particular emission that we are seeing in gamma ray. So here is what we see in radio, and this is a boomerang pulsar with nebula. So this is a really strong non-thermal X-ray compact pulsar with nebula, but we don't know what this diffuse emission is coming from. And so a lot of people are saying that, oh, maybe there is a pulsar moving this way. Um, likely, there's an uncertainty there. Uh, but you know you cannot really kick from that location. It's, uh, it's uh, the distance is about five kiloparsecs away or so. So it's too too long for the person to kick from the origin of where supernova happens to go go there. So it's not really related to that. But we do see diffuse radio emission in this region, which really really diffuse. I almost cheated to make this plot to basically you know 
maybe this one page completely oversaturated to show that there is some emission there. But when you look at the gamma ray sky, if you tilt it because uh, I somehow decided to use different coordinate system, but <laughs> the contour here you are seeing here is a radio contour, it's the same contour as that. And so gamma ray, you see that there is a more emission coming from this diffuse emission. Now, is the blue, blue uh, diamond, the yeah. air, air box? Yeah. Of what? This is a Fermi GEV gamma ray measurement. Okay. And so basically all the GEV and higher gamma ray is coming from this region. And the lasso error, error cross. Yeah. That's consistent with the Fermi. Yeah, everything is consistent. Sort of more or less consistent. And so Hug is over there, but you know, given the systematic uncertainty in the pointing okay. and everything, it's everything is consistent and then and toward the tail region. Also another reason thing to remember is Hug barely Thing, so it's uh, not very significant. So more like Veritas is probably the all uh, Veritas and Magic is the only instrument that can actually spatially resolve <coughs> this reason because Hawk and Lasso and for me is point light source. That's another reason why it's complicated, right? Because of the well, point spread function is so bad. But Lasso, you're saying they have an upper bound on the angular size, or they claim that they can measure extension, but it's not really strong because that's basically about their angular resolution size. And so they can claim something, but I'm not quite trusted. Um, so it's uh, it's point light for them. But it, it's less than what? About a few arc minutes or? Uh... Oh, I see. Uh, let's see. Let me think about it. So 0 0.1 degrees about that size. That's about the IACT's angular resolution. Yeah. Yeah. And 0 0.3 is about that green circle. Yeah. That's yeah. the angular resolution of the lasso. And oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So so it's a really like a slight, ever so slightly if it is a uniform emission, but obviously it's more tail. So it's below a degree, but not much below. No, not much. Um, that's even 68% containment value. So if you contain the 99%, it's even worse. In the white oval, it's the Veritas error. Yeah, it's uh, our old error. Uh, it's just because uh, this is not error, this is actually extension, because uh, for Veritas, so it's a clear, yeah, it's reserved. So this uh, column map that you are seeing is Veritas. And so for Veritas, it's extended source. It's clearly extended with extension of 0 0.3 degree, which matches with uh, what we see from the other observation. So it's really unclear why we are seeing here, and people, if you read the Veritas discovery paper, we pointed out that, oh, maybe there's a molecular cloud interaction happening, but there's not actually a strong molecular cloud in the region. 106, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, there is a molecular cloud stronger here, actually. <laughs> Gigantic molecular cloud there. But, you know, if you look at the CO emission, there's not much going on there. And there's not much going on in non dormer X-ray or non dormer radio. Radio is barely there. And so we don't know what is the cause of this emission that we are seeing. We observed a pretty long exposure with uh, uh, X-ray observation and things like that. We didn't really see any clear counterpart. So this is uh, like one of the example of uh, unidentified source, right? We do see strong, strong gamma ray. This is 2% of crap, uh, but we don't know where it's from. But it's definitely a pretty interesting case because we do see very, very strong and high energy gamma ray observation. Uh, one thing that I would like to say is that this is so strong source and in the northern hemisphere being nice. Uh, so ice, ice cube may be able to constrain because it's so strong that ice cube can, should be able to see it. If we don't see it, then it means it's uh, it's not uh, hadron, right? But uh, the fact that we are so close to say something about the origin is really interesting. But this is actually a lucky case. There's a lot of unidentified sources that is not be ice cube will not ever. So this is almost a pebble concept, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you got unidentified. Is this like the hardest one, or do you have other ones? No, there are some other thing that is actually. There's still the galactic plane. Yeah. Havitron might be in the galactic plane somewhere. But you don't still, know we still do not know, but yeah, there is a chance. Um, it's, a, it's a not easy case. Um, another thing that unidentified, so, uh, this is a little bit different case, but uh, since we talked about IACT versus uh, ground array, if you ever read about very high energy gamma ray, you need to be very careful about how to interpret their, especially a hot result. 
this is my crucial uh, stu study uh, story kind of a slide here. So here is uh, what Hack sees in particular Persaway Nebula D495, reason this is Persaway Nebula there, and this is what Veritas see. And we say, oh, we do see the same source here. So let's plot our plots together. And this is how we plot the plots together from the Fermi lot up to Hog energy range. And this is what Hog sees in that particular region of the sky. And if I look at the same region with the Veritas, I see about seven times lower flux level than Hog. And the reason why is just because the Hog's angular resolution is big. So they just uh, estimate any flux that fits into that uh, field of view. So what that means is if there is any diffuse emission around the region, then they would include that flux estimation. Compared to that, Veritas just cannot. We stand that Veritas analysis is basically using the background around the area to estimate how much background you expect to see in the source region. So if you have a diffuse region around the area, then we basically remove the diffuse emission by focus using that as background template. And so I'm, what I'm saying is that we need to be careful. It's useful to have both measurements because that gives different information about the source reason, but just uh, before picking up the half measurement, you need to ask yourself, or I, I hope you will ask yourself, what did ISET see? Because that is indicating something about it. So before I make a five minute, um, wrapping up, just because I know that some of you are interested in a neutrino. Neutrino is really interesting just because it is purely coming from the hadronics interaction. So if you see neutrino from some part of the sky, you are sure that is hadronic accelerator. So that is a beauty part about, part about the neutrino. Another beauty part about beautiful part about the neutrino is because gamma ray cannot travel farther than redshift of one. So if you wanted to study about TEV or PEV interaction happening in the outside of our galaxy, then neutrino is your only method <coughs> to study. And the neutrino is really hard because background from the cosmic ray is even worse for neutrino. Uh, but Ice Cube is uh, currently the only neutrino telescope that can measure the signal coming from the universe. And we have been making a lot of progress. The most recent progress being we now see galactic plane. Of course, we don't know whether what we see is galactic plane or about galactic plane mixed with a galactic source. We still do not know. It's barely five sigma, but kind of gives uh, one milestone and hopefully with more observation and improve the sensitivity of the detector, uh, we can reserve the galactic plane in the near future. But I don't have a lot of time, but I, I assume also you already know these things. Um, so I was just pointed out, so in, in case if you want to talk about it after the seminar, we can talk about it. So there are currently three source candidates. I say three source candidates just because I'm strictly experimentalist. And so I abide to uh, my community rule of not considering source if it is less than five sigma. And neutrinos case, we don't have any source that is above five sigma post trial right now. Uh, galactic plane is very close to it, but it's still four point whatever sigma. And there are two other source chain today, which is three sigma to four sigma range. So I will just introduce them. One is the TXS 0506 plus 0556. And so this is basically a high energy neutrino coming in a direction and we looked at it and uh, there was a gamma ray flaring happening and there was blazer there. So that was uh, three sigma coincidence. We don't know whether that actually was a real signal or not. We are just waiting for a similar event to happen. We waited a few years, we haven't seen anything as significant as this one. That doesn't exclude anything, we just need to keep looking at it. So that's one thing. Another thing is we looked at ice cube data because TXS 0506 seems to be interesting. So we looked at ice cube data and the so neutrino access in 2014 with about uh, I think 100 days of scale of flaring, flaring with the quotation. Um, and that is about 13 plus minus five event compared to that, this one was a single event, right? So this is a huge amount of neutrino if it is real, uh, came from the particular flare. And so that was interesting, but at the same time, this is archive search, and we didn't send the alert to the community at that time, so we don't have as a complete real-time message observation. So we are now searching for these kind of cases, and ICT and other places has been um, chasing for this kind of event for now, when was this? Now five years or so, and we again didn't see a significance of this one. Again, that doesn't mean anything, 
maybe this is a rare event. Again, this is about the Sigma event we are seeing. So we just need to keep following and see how it goes. Uh, the problem, not problem, but the challenge is that the following all the ice, ice cube between our learn is challenging for the <coughs> Another thing that is e actually even a little bit more um, promising in a way uh, is uh, stable access that we are seeing from nearby C for the galaxy NGC 1068, which is looking beautiful like that. But if you go to the high energy, this is the beautiful sky map that you see. Um, that's the that's the kind of life we are living. And so when so basically, I was part of this study. So what I did was I collected a promising source with the criteria, uh, and the NGC 1068 was there. It was blind uh, selection, so I didn't know that the source was there. And we searched for the neutrino signal, and then this one was the hottest spot with about three sigma significance. And so that was interesting, but also interesting thing was this was stable source, meaning that it's not flaring source. What that means is that you just keep waiting and improving your analysis and see whether it improves as time goes or as you improve your sensitivity. And that's what we did. So, so hang on a second. Yeah. How many neutrinos do you think you saw there? 60. 60. This is a low energy included, and that's why there's a lot of data. And yeah. the low energy means more background, so it's about statistics. That's yeah. why this is There is no, so, so with those 16 neutrinos, do they come, they all come at the same time? No, it's so a spread there. over 10 so, years. Oh, over 10, that's yeah, okay, because it's an AGN, and it's also got a very thick torus between yeah. it and us. Yeah. yeah. Which would be a nice place to make neutrinos. That's right, yeah, yeah that's right. That's so, right. so how, how is it like a, the type 2 seeper? No, no, I, I know, but like over Analysis. 10 years, how do, uh, like, is there any, like, how, how are they separated? It's six per year. You get out every two months, you get a new few months. No, I mean, yeah. we cannot do that. That's uh, that's going to kill your significance because trial number yeah. is easy. Exactly. And so what we do is to minimize the trial number, we set the data set. This is your chunk of what, 10 year that you are looking at. Don't look at your data. What are you trying to search? And I say, okay, given this criteria completely blinded, and I'm going to search this 110, they give me try a factor of uh, 110, and I now open the box. What do I see? And that was the answer. So how do you how are you certain it doesn't come together with a flare? Uh, this is a shame to find the bias cube analysis, um, just because we have a 300 people looking at the sky. So if you are really truly blinding analysis, you should not really look at your data. We don't strictly do it, but there are people who is completely independent to search for it. Uh, not really, no, no, they are not taking pick. What they are doing is they are searching for time in the time dependent signal from sources and 1061, 68 has 10 like completely independently was a part of their search. And so from that study, we know that it's not clear. And so it has to be, it's very, 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 very important because blindness is very important. Otherwise, we cannot put any significant number. And it's very easy to kill your significance. Five sigma is nothing to kill. Um, so you need to have like at least 10 sigma not to not be killed by the trial. So that's why I'm very careful at describing what we are doing. All right. So what we did was after that we improved our analysis and uh, and then I will look at the sky again with the same criteria to see whether we see improvement and we do see about one sigma improvement which is really promising or the sky map looks promising but at the same time at this point I'm just give me about twice more data and we will see just because you know significance is uncertainty is about significance so you know four sigma plus minus sigma is still consistent but uh, if I am trying to put myself as a more optimistic point of view, it's either really because of the negative significance or something. So it is a still very hot spot. It's the hottest spot we see. One thing I pointed out here is the differences between this source and TXS0506 source. Because TXS0506, as you know, we searched and we found a source with the three sigma significance by correlating gamma ray and neutrino. So what that means is in that source, whatever happens, the gamma ray was created together with the neutrino, or that was a hypothesis that we are searching for. And this particular case is time independent to search, and this, uh, the thick line that we are seeing, the uh, dark line we are seeing is a neutrino emission estimation, and 
This is nearby enough so the camera can actually see. So IACT people looked at it, and this is upper limit. So you can see the neutrino emission is order of magnitude higher than gamma rays. So what that means is this is a totally different case compared to TXS0506. We don't know whether gamma rays correlate with the neutrino or not. But we, don't, we do know the PP interaction should create both gamma ray and neutrino. So what that means is, as you said, uh, there has to be some environment that will absorb and prevent gamma ray to escape but let the neutrino uh, pass through. So that's why people are all coming up with a particularly strong corona radiation field that can kill gamma ray effectively with gamma-gamma interactions. But still, there's ongoing study going on. And also, in Ice Cube's point of view, there are independent secret galaxy study is ongoing, which is about the sigma. So that's all the signal you're going to see, the sigma for sigma. Etc. So, but again, I think it's uh, interesting. And the good thing about this is it being not flaring source, you just need to wait about five more years. And if it is real, then you should eventually see passing five sigma. So, hopefully, you will hear that hopeful news in five years or so. I mean, five years, I think, is uh, pessimistic actually with improving analysis. Uh, we can get there actually even faster. Uh, I will not go and get detailed. So, okay, I, if I can spend one more minute. Um, gamma ray in the future, what will happen is ICT is going to be even bigger. So now we have uh, tens of telescopes in one location, actually two locations, south and north, and that will improve uh, ICT sensitivity by 10 times. And, and then also pushing the energy threshold to lower energy, which is really promising for the extra galactic search. And so that will be really nice. And for the neutrino um, telescope, currently, again, IceCube is the only telescope that can see uh, neutrino coming from the outside, uh, um, you know, outside the solar system. But in the future, we should definitely have KM3Net. It's already under construction, have about 30 streams, and they started to see two <coughs> sigma uh, detection of diffusion neutrino emission. So, they will be really nice to have. And then P1 is one thing that is very prototyping. Baikal is actually under construction. They will get to the one cubic kilometer very soon. One other thing I wanted to point out is medium differences. So ice cube or P1 or any neutrino observation requires a huge size of detector. We are talking about cubic kilometer, right? We detect is kilometer by kilometer by kilometer. It's huge. And so you need to rely on the medium to propagate your light so that you can detect it. That's how we sample the light and detect it. <coughs> ice cube is obviously under the ice, and these three detectors is under the water. And water is really nice because the light is scattered less in the water than ice. So what that means is your neutrino's angular resolution will about 10 times better for the water Cherenkov detector. And so that means your background will be smaller. So there is a good chance that this detector may start to see something. Um, so that would be interesting. Thing to look at. So I almost over time, so I need to stop here. But I would say that it's a really exciting time. We are not quite about to answer the source of high energy crossing ray accelerator, but we do see we do see about 200 of a different high energy accelerator in the universe, and we learn a lot. Of, I didn't go into the deep, but every single thing comes with a lot of questions, like why we are seeing this. Okay. Uh, and so there's a lot of questions we need to answer, and I do want to talk with you because we can talk each other to understand because in the end everything matters is also environment as much as particle isolation. So I would like to talk with the people about that because I am more particle experimentalist. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
such that, as you pointed out, like UV and um, gamma rays, he also said this gamma rays can be relatable to the um, cosmic ray amount too. But still, these are not solving my problem on modeling the cosmic rays when I uh, look for the CO luminosity and radiated transfer codes. So can we relate the number of cosmic rays to the other features, other parameters in these galaxies? Like, um, I'm just improvising right now, uh, maybe the star formation rate or something else. I know there is no relation between these two, especially when we are talking about the extragalactic cosmic rays, mm -hmm. but do we have these sources or do we have these features that we can relate, although there will be lots of deviations with the cosmic rays? That is showering the galaxy. Are you looking at our galaxy or just generally speaking? Uh, I'm generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, in CO's case, it really it's harder to generalize, right? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty in the CO emission itself. And the cosmic ray and how it is interacting and creating the gamma ray, for example, is also related with the field factor of a CO cloud, for example. And, uh, and that is hard. So one of the things that I know people have done is actually diffuse gamma ray emission is more just because you basically start with assumption that all the diffuse gamma ray uh, is coming from the same cosmic ray flux, which is not totally true. We do expect it to see some spatial distribution. But if you assume that, then I think there is some, some, something you can say about the CO cloud distribution. But at the same time, I don't think there is easy to say we are more interpreting, we are more relying on what you see if CO people, then we can interpret in the gamma ray kind of. Um, so let's see another thing what we can do. I think if there is a, if ICT, the CTA comes in online and they improve their angular resolution, it's going to be more better than the Veritas. And so if you can really spatially measure the distribution on the CO cloud that you know very well, and we need to say something. But then you need to somehow assume the cosmic ray diffusion in the reason. But I mean, again, in the end, uh, we know what would happen, right? We know there is a particle distribution. We do know the CO2, we know the gamma ray created. So in the end, the both sides should see the same picture. So in that way, I think we can collaborate to see whether the picture coming from the gamma ray to the CO cloud uh, and the cosmic ray makes sense versus CO cloud to uh, distribution. I mean, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It's uh, both direction has to make sense. So that way we can collaborate, but I don't think like this is a feature that you can totally use to estimate the CO cloud. That I think is harder. Actually, I didn't go into detail, but like for example, IC443, I made it very simple. Like, oh, this is where we see the CO cloud, but the actual story is a little bit uh, more complicated because there's a CO cloud, but the distribution is not quite exactly correlated exactly. with the CO cloud density that we see. The reason why is when we look at, I mean, again, <coughs> we always need to talk about statistical significance, like how much are you sure that this is uh, statistically correlated. So what study that we did was actually correlating the gamma ray emission flux level with the CO cloud uh, density as we see. And it looked like it actually is better matched with the shaft, to a, uh, shaft cloud interaction better than CO cloud density itself. And so it is again complicated. We can say that you cannot just naively integrate the CO strength and say that that is density. We know that that doesn't work. I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot give you a clear answer, but it's usually the case in real stories more complicated. Right, so if you need a complication, I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so I wonder if you could expand a bit on the uh, neutrino array, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It's got the uh, three, uh, it's three uh, water-based and uh, yeah. and then uh, ice cube. Right. This one, right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> what's the time scale for this all coming online? That is a great question, and it's million dollar, or more than million dollar question, I bet. Uh, KM3Net is uh, right now under construction. They have uh, more than 20 some strings under construction. But at the same time, they have been slowing down quite a lot. I think it's also because of the internal European politics and funding agency. I said, rather, I don't want to go into detail because I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but they are putting few strings every year. So eventually they will get there, but I don't. 
how fast they can get there, depending really on the how much funding flow is going on. They have a technology, they know how to do it, they will just need the money at this point. Um, so they have they are ongoing and by how in Russia they build in their own scale. So that's on Okay. Baikal is a Baikal lake, yes. and they have been also deploying quite a lot. They, I don't know when they will reach. I think it will be sooner than KM Greener from the projection. I just purely project <coughs> their recent progress. You know, if um, you're getting along with the other uh, groups, uh, given the uh, political situation in the world, we are supposed to talk each other. <laughs> uh, I feel like we don't really talk each other as much as I want to. Um, so are you directly involved in the neutrinos? I am part of Ice Cube. You're Ice Cube, right? right. Yeah. And P1 is, where is that exactly? P1 is Cas Cas Cascada, I think. I think a basin. It's a really off from Vancouver Island. It's, it's in Canada. It's in Canada, say Canadian, it's USA, it says USA, it's somewhere in between. I think it's a special. It's NSF, KC, to get the money to say it's international waters. No, it is Canadian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like somehow the slide is. It's, uh, it's a close enough to the US. Does that mean that Canada's got correct uh, money on the table for P1? Yes. So uh, we recently got how much? Two millions like CFI, IF funding, we just got granted this year. And so that means, that, and then we also got two million from Europe, and USA is also trying to join. So we will put five streams, which is a small number of array, uh, in, the, in, in the water in the next five years. So, so the good thing about P1 is that it is using um, Canadian, there's a underwater OC, ONC, underwater power plant existing and they already have gigabits electric internet already connected and the power line already laid down so what we need to do is just hooking up and then it will be ready with the idea situation so um ideally we will put five strings and after that we basically need to find the funding source that will give us tens of million then it can be really just money that we just put it in but it's done in collaboration with the us yes and um, how many uh, scientists in Canada would you say are engaged uh, in people? Right now, we are about six people. Six? Yes. So how do you protect these, especially in the case of P1, yeah. protect it from whales? Why <laughs> I never heard of a whale being problem. It's uh, underneath, it's uh, underneath the two kilometer underneath of the ocean, so... Oh, yeah, but it goes yeah. down there. Yes. The only uh, thing that we worry about there is like bioluminescence. Yeah. <laughs> when the wind passing through, there's a glow of light coming on. There's a dust of a sea snow, people say. The sun yeah. that is uh, obscuring European view of uh, about a few percent per year. Well, that is there any issue think. with stuff growing on the. It's, a, it's not stuff growing more so than that sea snow accumulating on the surface of a European view yeah. over here. But uh, that reduction is 2%, and so if you're operating for 10 plus years, it's not. How do you tinker them in place? There, we, you basically get everything. So it's, they're anchored from the, the ocean Bottom. floor yeah. yes. and they're buoyant. That's right. That's right. And so they sway a little bit like That's they right. help. Yes. Think about event in construction. <laughs> yes. It's uh, it's uh, not going to be fun. <laughs> and it's in ice, it's a close. We don't know how it is frozen, but it's uh, our frustration, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, people have done. I mean, KM3 net is uh, based on the previous Antares, which was exactly the same formation. So, tentatively, we should know how to do it. Other questions? Then, that's thank you for again. Yeah. <laughs>